the human world is not an easy place to live in. It's because we're all feeding. It's not just physical food. We feed off emotional food, relationships, power, status, wealth. In fact, the hunger of the body is almost nothing compared to the hunger of the mind. As the Buddha once said, even if it rained gold coins, we'd never have enough for our sensual desires. The sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations we'd like to feed off of. And with each person's mind being so hungry, it's inevitable there's going to be a lot of conflict. As our unlimited desires meet up with a limited source of food. Like the Buddha's image of the world was of a puddle of water that was shrinking, and there are fish fighting over at the last little bit of water, pushing one another out of the way. And so what do you do? I mean, you have the choice. You can just continue feeding, feeding, feeding. Or you can step back and look at your hunger. This is one of the purposes of meditation, is to give you a place to step back, to give you better food, food that comes from inside rather than from outside. Food that you don't have to fight off anybody or you don't have to go harming anyone else to get. You learn to get the mind focused in one place. and It's a combination of having a comfortable place physically to focus. This is why we work with the breath, try to notice where in the body do you feel the breathing, where does it feel comfortable. When you breathe in, which part of the body is getting satisfied by the in-breath? Focus on that spot. Where is the satisfaction the strongest? Don't clamp down on it, just be there with it. And notice when the breath is getting too long or too short, too heavy or too light. Work with that. There's also the pleasure that comes of having the mind being able to focus on one thing and not being forced to jump around all the time. Because the mind always has a sense that the food it has is never enough. It's sitting here f feeding on one thing and it's thinking about what's next, where is the next place? Do I stay here or do I have to go someplace else to feed? What's next? Where next? What's next? Where next? These are the questions that keep driving the mind. And as long as we let ourselves be driven by them, we don't really see how much our habit of feeding is causing a lot of suffering for ourselves and for other people. So part of the practice is learning how to step back and reflect on your actions to see what you're doing that instead of giving a sense of nourishment is actually causing suffering or is causing suffering in the, in the act of trying to find nourishment. Instead of feeding off of status and power, we learn how to feed off of generosity and virtue. But in particular, we want to learn how to feed off a state of concentration, because when the mind is centered, it can put down a lot of its burdens. It's not quite so driven. You're still feeding, but the food is much better. The rapture that comes when the mind settles in. Rapture here meaning a sense of fullness, a sense of complete energy, complete in the sense that every part of the body feels nourished by the energy. Sometimes it's stronger than that. But that sense of rapture, then the sense of ease, and finally the sense of equanimity that come when the mind finally is settled down and is fully centered. That's really strong nourishment for the mind. It also puts you in a much better place to see exactly how the mind is feeding. When it starts going off to nibble on the past or gulp down the future, you see a lot more clearly that the things you're feeding on are not really all that nourishing. And the act of having to go out and feed that way, that in and of itself it creates a lot of stress, a lot of pain for the mind. 
So this is an important practice here, giving the mind alternative food. Will to help pull it out of the rat race so that we're dealing with other people. You're not feeding off of them and you actually have more to offer. Your relationship becomes more a relationship of giving. You give of your time, you give of your energy, you give of your help. That makes the world an easier place to live in. Because you're not so bound up in the the battle among the fishes. You got that last little gulp of water. Ultimately, you can look at the mind that's in concentration and see that even its act of feeding is a burden for the mind. And that's where you incline your mind to something that's unconditioned. In other words, you don't have to feed on anything at all. That's the happiness we're looking for. That's the only happiness that's really safe. Because it saves us from having to fight for our food or look for our food or worry about that question of what next, what next, where next could I go? And you begin to see that the practice all along has been one of stepping back and asking different questions. What's driving your actions? And what are the results of your actions? If they lead to stress, is that stress necessary? There's some stress that's necessary in getting the mind into concentration and working with the path. When you take the precepts, especially the eight precepts, you suddenly find you can't eat in the evening. That's cutting off an immediate source of food. And the lesson is you've got to look elsewhere for your nourishment. So there's some pain in training yourself in this practice. So at the extent to which some of that stress is necessary, you put up with it. Keep at it. But you find there's an awful lot that's not necessary at all. The mind is just piling on extra stress and extra suffering. Worried about this, jealous about that, creating all kinds of mental stories that have no basis in reality, and yet you use them to feed on in a way that's really unhealthy. The mind can do all kinds of things. But you begin to see when the mind gains a sense of well-being, gains a sense of nourishment from the concentration, that that kind of feeding is totally unnecessary. You've got a much better source of food right here. So focus on learning how to enjoy the breath. Learn to be a connoisseur of your breathing. You might call this an attachment, and it is. But it's a good attachment. You've got to learn how to hold on to good things in order to let go of the bad ones. And John Mahabur makes a comparison with climbing a ladder up to a roof. You don't just let go of the rungs, you hold on to one rung so that you can grasp the higher one. And when you've grasped the higher one, then you let go of the lower one so you can grasp one that's still higher. Keep going up and up and up the ladder. Finally, when you get to the roof, that's when you can let go of the ladder entirely. So as long as you still need to hold on, learn how to hold on to something good. Helps get you out of the rat race. And it can take you to a place where ultimately you don't need to feed. We can let go of that question of where to feed next, what next, where next. You realize you don't have to answer that question anymore. That's a huge burden off the mind right there. Because you found a happiness that doesn't depend on conditions, a happiness that stands outside of space and time. One that's totally secure. You never have to worry about a food source again because you don't need to feed. The happiness is just there. That's what we're working toward.
So as long as you need to feed, keep feeding right here at the breath. No one else is going to come and try to take it away from you, and you're not, of course, you're not taking anything away from anyone else as you breathe, breathe, breathe in, breathe out. This is your breath. It's totally your territory. So learn to get as much nourishment out of it as you can. <laughs>